Right, well this is a little bit embarrassing, but it turns out that much of what you were about to watch is wrong. And here's why. When I started doing the research for this, I asked the guys here at Fort Benning, what kind of tank have you exactly, M67? And I said it's an A1 according to the records. I script and I film for an M67 A1. Yet, as we're going around, there's a couple of things that don't quite make sense. So inside, if you look at the plate, it says it's for an M48A2 hole, which is correct for an, M40, uh, an M67A1. But there are some other things that had me asking questions, so I asked them. And bless them, they took the time out of their day, and I thanked them for it to do some detailed research on this particular tank. And it turns out, hey, it's not an M67A1, it is a Vietnam War vet M67A2. And hence it has some modifications. Uh, you'll see on the back it's got the Vietnam War type vision cupola. And so when I'm talking about some of the modifications, especially talking about the engine, I'm wrong. Because I will be talking about the fuel injection uh, engine, not the diesel that the Marines converted their M67s to M67A2s. So with that caveat in mind, I will be showing you an M67A2 and talking about an M67A1. On with the show. After World War II, there was work started on a flame tank version of M26. However, after a little bit of assessment, the Army concluded that it was perhaps a little bit inefficient to have tanks whose sole purpose was to carry a flame. So they basically bailed from the program. The Marines, however, which traditionally used the tank in a close infantry support role, saw things a bit differently, and they wanted to continue the concept. So work was continued using a T-42 as a base tank, but then that got nixed. So they converted the project to the M-47. Uh, but as that was just an interim tank created for the Korean tank panic, that got nixed. So they started with one based off of the M-48. Now what they ended up with was an M48A1 with a slightly modified turret and a flame gun. That became known as the M67. At this point, the Army began to wonder, what is it that the Marines know that we don't? So they decided to get in on the act after all. They made their conversions off of the M48A2. And we'll go over some of the differences as we go around, but basically the main ones are the fuel injection on the engine and a few changes to the running gear. This became the M67A1. Oddly enough, I'm standing in front of an M67A1. It belongs to the US Army's Armor and Cavalry Collection. It's part of the training facility here in Fort Benning, Georgia. And they've been nice enough to let me have a look around it. It's uh, just been moved into the new facility. They haven't had time to clean it up inside yet, unfortunately. So it's gonna look a little bit less than ideal, but it is the only M67 I can think of that I can get at and it's a little bit of an interesting vehicle people don't think about so why not starting as ever at the front of the tank you can tell it's an m48 it even looks like an m48 with the dummy gun yet of course if you look closely you'll see that the gun is a little bit shorter it's a little bit fatter it's got a nozzle at the end careful and there are holes on the side for air intake because okay, you got to have air for combustion and there are also drain holes at the bottom for unspent fuel to drip out. Three periscopes for the driver, the standard M48 mountlet. Uh, right hand side used to be a direct uh, vision port for the gunner's sight. Left hand side used to be the coax. Well, that has changed. The left hand side is now completely empty. And the right hand side is now the coax because you don't have a gunner's auxiliary sight. You don't really need one on this thing. It's about four inches, 4.3 inches sloped at 60 degrees, but being round and cast, that's more of a guideline than a hard figure for the entirety of the front. Uh, the gun shield, that's about four and a half inches sloped at 30. And the rest of the turret, again, it varies due to where you're looking, but it's the basis was seven inches at zero. So that's the effectiveness that they were looking for. The headlight guards, well, they were supposed to be, according to Honeycutt, flattened a little bit compared to other M48 headlight guards because the main gun could depress a bit further. Although, looking at the other M48s and the M103 next to it, I personally don't see it a difference. So make of that what you will. Behind the guards, IR headlight, service headlight, convoy marker lights, 
three periscopes for the driver, your tow hooks at the front, fenders, they're bolted down, you can't lift them up like an Abrams, for example. And, well, that's about the size of it. To all intents and purposes, it looks like an M48. Let's come around to the side. You see the typical American compensating idler link. So as the road wheel comes up, you can see it pivots around this point here. This will push this arm forward. This arm then pushes the compensating idler outwards. So as the track run gets shorter, because you've moved up the, run, the road wheel, it stretches out on the other end. Other changes, you're going to see the snubbers, friction snubbers on the one, two, and last road wheel stations. There used to be hydraulic shocks in the A1. Another change are the bump stops. So there is a double bump stop now on the number one road wheel. There used to only be one bump stop and it remains one bump stop for the others. So obviously would, they were taking a bit of a knock. So they had to change that. Tracks, 28 inches wide, 79 links per side. Your typical American double pin with end connectors and wedge bolts. Scale 36 inch wall or cross, about an eight and a half foot trench. Then as you come around the side, you're gonna see the stowage fenders. Obviously on the other side also you see the personal heater exhaust on the far side. Uh, air cleaner boxes are external. Another stowage box further back. You're gonna see the handrail on the side, the blister for the rangefinder. Of course there is no rangefinder, you don't need one, but why change the casting on the turret and Besides, if the whole point of the dummy gun is to make it look more like an M48, what's the harm? And then further behind the handrail, you're going to see stowage ordinarily for a couple of jerry cans. Come around to the back of the vehicle, you're not going to see anything that's unfamiliar to students of late Cold War American vehicles. So your final drive housings are here with your fluid ports. The big grill area combines both the cooling air and the engine exhaust. So you can see the discoloration here is uh, where the engine exhaust comes out. The rest of the grill is all the other air circulated by the cooling system. Taillights, convoy marker lights, access ports, pintle mount. This little cover here is for a power takeoff. I'm not quite sure what you would do with the power takeoff of this thing, but that's what the port is for. And of course it is an infantry support tank. So there is a intercom box on the right rear. It does seem to be missing the lid though. The engine deck, of course, is a site of a major change. Travel lock on the back. Under the engine deck, well, firstly, the engine deck itself is now nice and flat. Good for sleeping on. Also part of the infrared suppression system that they installed after the original M48s. Underneath, the change to the M48A2, the Continental AVI 1790 8. V12, 1791 cubic inches, 835 horsepower, 1670 foot-pounds of torque. The big change, of course, it is now fuel injection, hence the I in AVI, as opposed to the earlier carbureted system. Unfortunately, this didn't actually result in as great an increase in mileage per gallon as was anticipated. However, the new redesigned engine was a lot more compact, didn't have outrigger fans as the original engine did, which meant that you could have a little bit more fuel stowage. About 135 gallons worth of fuel stowage, bringing the total up back to 330. Thus, given this tank a range of approximately 140 miles on the road. If you think that is a major increase, well, you'd be right, because the original M48s were rated for all of 70, that's seven zero miles before tanks. And yeah, that, that ain't great. Otherwise, underneath the side, let's see if I can open this up. I suspect not, but we'll see what we can see. Oh, okay, you can. And of course, I can't open up this one because of the turret in the way. But what I do see is apparently a dipstick. I do. There is sadly nothing in it. Oh well. Behind it is the CD850-5. It's a cross-drive two-range transmission. No huge surprises there. 
Moving to the turret, well, you've got your ventilator housing here. Uh, they've kept the locking latch for the lotus hatch, and I don't know why, because I can't imagine any circumstance that hatch would be open when the tank is in operation. Probably just nobody told the guys at the turret manufacturer not to install it, so they did. The basket on the back is not exactly huge by modern standards, but this is only a three-man crew so I'm sure it would have been adequate for at least this tank's purposes. Plus, of course, you can always tie things onto the handrails on the side. Although, personally, I would be reluctant to put anything onto the side that I might not be willing to see lost. That's just me. Lastly, the TC's cupola. It is the later type. It's been increased in height by about 8 inches, but it does greatly increase the vision. Right, that's it. I will see you in part two. Coming down to the side, oh, the far side, by the way, you're going to see a personnel heater exhaust. Past the running gear, six pairs of road wheels per side, torsion bar suspension, of course, and five return rollers per side. Yes, we know the book says M48A2 only has three per side. The book says that. This says otherwise. And this has been a topic of quite some research so far uh, between myself and some of the staff here. And we're still going with M48A2 because that's not at least that's what it says you'll see on the builder's plate inside.